It is Friday, July 9th. Let's talk PlayStation. Welcome back, everyone. As always, before we get to our main stories, let's quickly go over our PS Plus reminder. The July games are available right now, the PS5 benefit being a Plague Tale Innocence, PS4 you're getting Call of Duty Black Ops 4, WWE 2K Battlegrounds, and don't forget that Virtual Fighter 5 Ultimate Showdown from last month. That stretches into this month as well, so you still have plenty of time to grab that one if you thought you missed it it's still there um, just make sure you go ahead and claim that and remember if you're still on ps4 haven't bought a ps5 use the mobile app that way you can claim all these native ps5 games that you can't play just yet by the time you get ps5 you'll have a, a ton of games waiting for you now for ps now we did get confirmation of the july lineup and if you watched last week's ltps then you know we had a leak there and Turns out most of it was true. Um, there were a few PS4 games missing, but to summarize that lineup, uh, for July on PS Now, it's Red Dead Redemption 2, downloading only, that's available until November 1st, Neo 2, Olympic Games Tokyo 2020, Judgment, and that will only be available until October 4th, NASCAR Heat 5, Moving Out, and God of War. So while this may not be the game changer that I think a lot of people are really looking forward to, it's still one where it bodes well for the future of PS Now when you look at prior months and see that well, for a long time there, it was very lackluster. You had three, four games added. There was almost always crossover with what was available previously or currently on PS Plus. And uh, this is the first time where I've ever seen PS Now trend on Twitter. In a single one month lineup, it caused PS Now to trend on Twitter. So you had a lot of people that otherwise would have never given PS Now the time of day, uh, whether it's other journalists, uh, media personalities, other channels. Um, you know, a lot of people that just largely ignored PS Now, they finally talked about it like, oh, is Sony finally doing something with this thing? Um, and that's been my criticism for quite a while, despite the fact that what's there is not bad. I mean, really, you're getting 800 something games. 500 streaming, 300 that are also downloadable. And you know, they started that uh, rotation of more premium S games uh, over a year ago now. I think they've been doing that for a little bit, but those are, you know, games with expiration dates. So they're somewhat more recent uh, just based off the deals that Sony works out. But inherently, they just haven't really done a whole lot with it. But what's there is still pretty good for $60 throughout the entire year if you pay up front or $10 a month if you pay monthly. But a big problem is also the fact that PS Now is not available everywhere. So there are many countries where it doesn't exist. Uh, but it does bode well that we're seeing things like Virtual Fighter 5 go day and date on Plus now and the game just launching in general. That and also Red Dead 2 only being available via download. That is a good thing because that tells us that Sony's probably getting more lax on this presumed mandate that games have to be available via streaming and downloading now if that is the case, right? PS3 content, it's gonna stay streaming. So this might be their option for offering PS Now in countries that have no proper streaming infrastructure for the time being. So PS Now would only be, you know, 300 something PS4 games and a, a few PS2 games. Um, so that would work there and they would just lower the price for that particular uh, territory and also PS5 native games. Um, so it's pretty obvious that Sony more than likely doesn't have PS5 server blades going or they're not installing them right now or they're allocating all that silicon and the production line for um, PS5 consoles going to consumers but when they eventually turn over you know the server rack and replace PS4 machines with PS5s because those can also play PS4 games that's probably going to work out great on their end um, that's when you can see PS5 games being offered for streaming and downloading but maybe for now once they add native PS5 games uh, perhaps those will only be uh, those will only have a download option right so while Sony is not going to get as aggressive as Game Pass, I think that's very clear, there are still many things that they can do to finally reach more consumers and also just better the service with uh, day and date releases from third party, adding more back catalog games, which they really should be doing, eventually consolidating with PS Plus, which I wish they would do. I'm not sure if they will at this point. Um, PS5 server blades, they're going at their own pace. Um, but these are things that they can do to slowly improve the service and the image of the service as well. But uh, anyway, moving on to our first actual news story here. PS5 got a new system software update, 21.01.03.21.00, and nothing major to report. It's just a slight improvement to the overall system performance. We are still waiting for a major firmware update, which will come uh, sometime later this year. I'm guessing it's probably slated for autumn, which prior to that we'll have uh, the first beta phase actually start. And so that's something where we'll find out about it relatively soon before um, the wide public release. And we'll also have a good idea of what features are uh, going to be included in the next major update. 
Now, speaking of updates, we can also mention Returnal's latest patch, 1.4.1, and this is not the patch that's going to include or hopefully would have included a much needed save exit function. So we're still waiting for them to evaluate this and figure out something reliable that will work properly. Uh, keep in mind at launch, Housemark was like, well, we don't really have anything ready to go. I guess we'll start looking at it. So at minimum, we're probably still a few weeks away, probably longer until that patch comes. But for now, we do have this one where if you were on the fence of playing the game because of the, the issues and bugs reported at launch, well, they are really fixing up the game now. And so this recent patch was uh, clearing up some issues with the daily challenge, but also uh, possibly some not so widespread save corruption problems, but those are fixed up. And then also Act 3 related trophies. These are big ones because if you did... If you completed certain tasks related to Act 3 and didn't, and didn't get the trophies, well, that means you would have had to play the whole game again, which would have been a huge bummer. So they've now enabled a way to, you know, re-encounter certain sequences again, and uh, that should be a way to unlock the trophies without starting a brand new save file, which is good. And, uh, well, for Sony and the recent acquisition of Housemark, we can go into our next story, which is Sony was not the only interested party in acquiring Housemark. It turns out there were... Possibly some other discussions and offers on the table, but Housemark ultimately did go with Sony. So recently, the CEO of Housemark was doing an interview and uh, talking about the interested parties, and he said, and I quote here, uh, Usual suspects, i.e. major players in the field from China, Sweden, and the United States. I have to say that there is a very special spring behind us, and the fact that we have been competing even feels a little surreal. In our discussions, it became clear that Sony wanted to buy us because we are doing something that others are not doing. Their starting point has not been that we would start making games according to the formula defined by Sony. This is, without a doubt, a very important angle to consider when it comes to the idea of possibly selling your company or being absorbed into a larger one. It's not just the price tag that you should focus on. Of course, if it's high enough, I mean, you might be willing to do certain things that you didn't want to do before, but there are conversations that come into play with your prospective interested parties about, you know, expectations, right? You know, what do you want from us? And more so, what would happen to us if we do accept the deal? You know, are we going to be closed? Are, you know, you going to lay people off? Are you going to change the work environment? And there's not, there's not any guarantees in that area, but you do want to have a certain level of safety going into, going into something like that, especially because many overlook the idea of, companies always want to sell. That's not always the case, right? So when we say Sony should acquire so-and-so or Microsoft should acquire, you know, developer X, Y, and Z, sometimes those developers don't want to actually sell. The price has to work out. Both parties have to be interested, but also for the smaller company, which would be Housemark in this case, they want some reassurance and the idea or the notion that um, they're picking a good partner that's not going to really change their formula or how they operate or uh, decide on their own projects and work on their own things because they were independent up till this point. And uh, for Sony, it seems like this was uh, the best fit for them. And we know that with Sony, they typically are very hands-off and they don't delegate nearly as much as say other publishers would uh, when it comes to funding and releasing a big uh, multi-million dollar project. Moving on to our next news story, Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut. It turns out I missed all the, uh, the upgrade conversations. Uh, one silver lining here and one cool thing is that if you do pre-order the game on the PlayStation Store from PS4 or PS5, you actually get immediate access to the PS4 version right now. So not too bad, right? If you didn't have the game at all to begin with and uh, you're interested in buying the Director's Cut on PS4 or 5, if you pre-order right now, you get uh, the current game right away, and that, of course, will allow you to also transfer your save file when inevitably the Director's Cut comes out, which would be actually pretty good on PS4 alone. PS5, I think you'd be better off waiting just so you can play the game from the very start with all those uh, performance enhancements and things like that. But if you're on PS4 where you're not going to be expecting those things and you're just waiting for uh, the Iki Island content as well, well, at least you can start playing uh, Ghost of Tsushima right away instead of waiting until the August 20th. Uh, release date. Next up, we've got a pretty interesting data point to go over when it comes to game sales, uh, or really we're just looking at one game in particular and how well that one game did, which is Dungeons & Dragons Dark Alliance. So for the UK sales chart ending July 3rd, we saw a very unique ratio of where this game was sold that we haven't really seen before. So for PlayStation hardware, it sold 54% on PS5, 42% on PS4, and this is a uh, physical at retail, and a mere 4% were on Xbox. And this is because of the circumstance the game found itself in, because it did not review well. It was uh, mostly mixed. Some people liked it, but also a lot didn't like it. So 
To put it bluntly, it was not a well-received game, uh, but it also launched day and date on Game Pass. And this is not the first time we've seen a game launch, you know, day and date on Game Pass, full price on PlayStation. I've just never seen, as, as far as we know, we've never seen the ratio um, this large when it comes to boxed copies at retail. But it's also something where we can't draw a major conclusion off of just this alone, because this is a game where, you know, it's, it really works quite well for Game Pass when it comes to you know, not wanting to spend 50, 60 pounds, pounds sterling on a game that you're probably not going to like or enjoy, but if it's there just sitting and waiting and it's a brand new game, why not try it? Maybe you will like it. Um, of course, there's gonna be some reluctance on spending money on it, and keep in mind the game probably didn't sell very well at all to begin with, right? It's just the ratio sounds overwhelmingly large on PlayStation, but there, there probably weren't many copies moved on PlayStation to begin with, you know what I'm saying? So it's not a crazy conclusion. I know a lot of people are trying to draw certain things about the, you know, implications of Game Pass and what that's going to look like three, four, or five years down the line and, you know, PlayStation and Nintendo still doing full price games. I know that's where a lot of people are talking about it. This isn't really the video for that, but the ratio itself I found was <laughs> quite large. Um, so I wonder if we'll see more of that for games that um, kind of re review in that range where it really is more favorable to just try the game out um, somewhere else on a, on a subscription. For our next story, let's go over the recent State of Play, which aired just yesterday. And this is something where, as per usual, it was announced on Tuesday. And thankfully, as Sony's been doing, and I really like that they have been doing this, they outlined exactly what to expect, which is we've got updates on indies, third-party stuff, a nine-minute section on Deathloop, and do not expect God of War, Horizon, or the next-gen PSVR, which those are all perfectly chosen things that we are expecting to hear about in the short term, but they said don't expect that. So I'm liking that Sony's very transparent about what we should be looking forward to when it comes to these State of Play live streams. And, uh, well, I guess we can just do a quick recap for those that didn't see or want a quick refresher on this. Here's every announcement in that state of play. It opened with Moss Book 2, announced for PlayStation VR. Love the first Moss, so I'm actually thrilled to see this. This was awesome. Uh, Arcade Geddon, early access today for PS5. This is a game where it's developed by Ilphonic, same developer of uh, Predator Hunting Grounds, so very online focused. Kind of a lot going on here. You got PVE stuff, PVP stuff, uh, very picturesque and a lot of different modes and loot that you can pick up. So again, early access today on PS5 or really yesterday on PS5. Tribes of Midgard, a new trailer and overview of classes. So we've got a few trailers here where we get a developer walkthrough explaining some things very briefly in about three, four minutes. But uh, I'm liking the visual art style of Tribes of Midgard. I might try that for a little bit. Uh, Fist Forged in Shadow, a new trailer with a release date coming September 7th, 2021 for PS4 and PS5. This is always a game that I keep forgetting about, but then when I see it, I'm like, oh yeah, that's coming. Uh, next up, Hunters Arena Legends. We got a developer overview on this game as well, showcasing the world, the modes, and just kind of what to expect when it comes to the uh, the gameplay loop. And we also found out that PS Plus members are getting this game August 3rd to September 6th. That's for PS4 and PS5 as well. So it's not uh, one benefit stuck to PS5. Both consoles are going to get this game as a plus benefit throughout all of August. We got a new trailer for Sifu showing the, the aging mechanic. If you don't know, every time you pass out or die, so to speak, your, your age goes up. Unfortunately, the game was delayed to early 2022, but still coming for PS4 and PS5. If they need more time in the oven, that's fine. Uh, if they need it, by all means. Uh, then Jet the Far Shore is next, another developer overview explaining the synopsis and what you can expect for gameplay, because this is a title where we haven't really seen a whole lot in terms of just how it plays and what you're what you're really doing here, but we got that. Um, that's still coming 2021 for PS4 and PS5. Then Demon Slayer, the Hinokami Chronicles, new trailer. That's coming October 15th, 2021 for PS4 and PS5. Lost Judgment, we got a new gameplay showcase. This is still coming September 24th, 2021, PS4 and PS5, global launch. Death Stranding Director's Cut, we finally got details on what's going on with this game, and there is a lot of new content, so there's new battles, melee mechanics, guns, there's a firing range, there's new delivery support items, there's racing now, of course there's new story missions, coming September 24th, 2021, we'll talk more about this in a later news story, uh, and then Deathloop, the deep dive that we were promised, uh, a showcase of gameplay, or really a showcase of how a full mission would play out, and that's coming September 14th, 
2021. And those are all the announcements from yesterday's state of play, which even accounting for all the expectations that were appropriately set, I can still see how some were underwhelmed by this uh, particular presentation. And for me personally, I've always said I would be fine with a presentation like this every you know, three, four months, every quarter, basically. It doesn't have to outline major stuff from first party or these big, you know, multi-million dollar projects, which everybody's always looking for that. It's not gonna happen every single live stream, but people are looking for that. I would be fine if Sony outlined, look, we'll do this every single quarter. Um, and here's just a lineup of the indies we're gonna showcase, some third party content that might include extra partnerships or whatever, or maybe Sony's got marketing rights or what have you, just something that always has a good showcase of software and there's no expectation that big things will show up unless they you know, decide to do that or maybe hold a separate event which is titled differently from State of Play and you make a clear distinction of, okay, this is a lineup of really cool games and there's nothing totally significant and here's where we have a, a product announcement of you know the next gen PSVR, here's where we're showcasing the next God of War trailer and it's just God of War where it's a nine, 10 minute walkthrough like we saw with Ratchet or Demon Souls. I mean, I think it's the, the state of play nomenclature that a lot of people are really getting hung up on. Um, but besides that point, I can see how some were underwhelmed because there was still so much missing because in the short term, despite God of War and Horizon and next gen PSVR kind of fitting that criteria, we are also still looking for Forspoken, Final Fantasy 16, those were completely gone from Square's E3, uh, GTA 5 expanded and enhanced all those indies that we saw last year for the, uh, the initial PS5 live streams that we had, right? So there's a lot of games and a lot of things that Sony can still talk about despite this live stream that we got. Um, and that's, I mean, really our next news story, which is that, uh, well, prior to the state of play in the PlayStation blog post, after setting expectations, they do outline that, yes, there are more updates coming throughout the summer. And throughout the summer sort of implies that uh, perhaps we're still not, uh, we're, we're not actually gonna get this more traditional hour long plus live stream, which is very much E3-esque, right? This is why I've been warning people for a very long time now, um, throughout most of 2021, we have no great indicator that they're actually holding that that typical traditional long form show. We just don't, we don't really know. They might piecemeal all this information out. And that's not to say those things on their own are going to feel less important. An eight, nine minute gameplay trailer of God of War is still God of War. Uh, a release date announcement of Horizon on the PS blog is still a release date confirmation. And those things still don't rule out a show that we can get in late August or sometime in autumn, September, somewhere around there, right? But we don't know, of course, because if it wasn't obvious, you can't really uh, pick up on what Sony's doing anymore because they haven't been at E3 for for three years now. They are not following the, the expected norms that all other publishers and even platform holders are following, and they've been following those things for, you know, the better part of, uh, well, over two decades now, right? Um, clearly, Sony's going in, in a direction where they're talking when they want to, they'll show what they want to um, on their terms, and that's fine because, I mean, we're going to get all the announcements and the news anyway. It's not really a, a major deal, but um, if Sony wants to control the messaging in the best way possible, it's, it's really all on them, and uh, maybe that's what they're planning on doing with this recently trademarked uh, PSX and this new idea of what PSX might look like, or just further more state of plays and live streams whenever they decide to, right? Um, I didn't think this was really bad, just that I understand where people are coming from. And uh, well, I'm happy about Moss. And Deathloop does look great. I know a lot of people are still lukewarm on that, but I think it's gonna come out and um, it's gonna feel and play great. And um, I think more people should probably give that a chance. But uh, anyway, moving on to Death Stranding, the director's cut. We just went over all the new things that we can expect, but there are some extra details that were cleared up over on the PS blog. So first off, the Half-Life and Cyberpunk content from the PC version is included in this PS5 version. There's some UI enhancements. There's new online features like friend play and leaderboards, and we don't have a clear idea of what that means. They said they'll talk about that later. There's the expected haptic feedback, adaptive triggers, and 3D audio. Also near instant load times. We always expect these, and I think the adaptive triggers are going to feel great on this game. And then there's two modes to choose from. Performance will have upscaled 4K at 60 FPS or up to 60 FPS. And then Fidelity will be native 4K with ultra wide and HDR support. In terms of upgrading for existing owners, it's $10. That's all it takes for a PS4 copy to Director's Cut on PS5. And for this time around, this is only a PS5 version, which costs $50 if you don't have the game whatsoever. So. 
if you just want to buy uh, Death Stranding Director's Cut on PS5, 50 bucks. Or you could also go out and find a cheap PS4 copy and then just pay the $10 upgrade fee and you've got the Director's Cut that way. And then save files also do transfer, or I guess transfer is what Kojima would call it, but save files will import as well. Uh, not too shabby. I'm really liking what I'm hearing, especially because I really enjoyed the game. I, I fell in love with it, honestly, so I am absolutely ready to play this game uh, all over again, or at least the new content if I can just import a save and check out all the new stuff from there. But of course, it was a, a point of contention for many when it came to Ghost of Tsushima and how that's being handled at 60 PS4, 70 PS5. $10 minimum for the, the visual enhancements and the dual sense features, which we see most publishers offer that for free and the new content naturally you would expect you have to pay for that. But here, uh, $10 for everything, all the visual enhancements, uh, bells and whistles, the, the new content as well, which I'm guessing for Death Stranding, which, you know, it took me over a hundred hours to platinum at a minimum, the new content should be about 10, 20 something hours, maybe more than that. I don't really know, but um, I did love the game, so I will totally be jumping in. I don't really know if I would recommend somebody who didn't like the original game, you know, get this. I mean, the game is still inherently, for the vast majority, going to be exactly how it was before, so I wouldn't really recommend that. But if you, you know, did play the game before or only got, say, halfway through it, I think this is going to be a great option. Moving on to our next news story, if you remember last week's episode, we talked about how Nico Parker, the actress, was cast to play as Joel's daughter, Sarah. And right after I uploaded that, we actually got our first picture of the cast on set. Filming has begun, and we can see that Pedro Pascal, Gabriel Luna, and Nico Parker are in an SUV. <laughs> if you've played The Last of Us, you know what this scene is likely referencing or at least setting up. Um, so now the long journey of uh, waiting probably over a year for this to be done and ready and beginning to air in late 2022 has uh, that wait has now begun. Next up, we definitely had to talk about this, but it looks like Sony made a pretty big mistake when it came to advertising their own product. So over on their Twitter account, and this is the Sony account, not the PlayStation one, which might explain why this person was uninformed or the ad agency was uninformed in uh, making this, but they put up an advertisement for PS5 where a gentleman is playing the console and you can clearly see the console is upside down. In the horizontal orientation, the disk drive is supposed to be on the bottom. It's supposed to be sitting on its stand. It's not, they quickly deleted the tweet, and what's even more hilarious is this was not the first time this happened. I don't think we brought this up on LTPS at the time just because there were so many news stories and I was trying to cover the most important ones, but this was still kind of huge where at one point close to PS5's launch, Herman Hulse, the head of PS Studios, he tweeted out a picture of PS5, and uh, in his own personal home, he had the console set up in the same way. It was wrong, no stand. Um, so it's just, you know, it's embarrassing, obviously, from their point of view. I think the company needs to maybe put out a memo like, hey, this is how this thing is set up. If you're going to, you know, do social media stuff or work with ad agencies, you need to be very deliberate and outlining how this thing needs to look. Um, for as much as I like the design of PS5, I know some people still keep calling it ugly. I like it. I think it totally nails the, you know, overly modern, contemporary, luxury look of, uh, of the hardware, but... As much as I like it, it's also a little overly designed uh, for the product category that it's in, and this kind of explains you know, the repercussions of that, where you have your own employees not understanding the right way that it's set up. So it is a simple mistake. It's not the end of the world. Everybody's human, of course, but it does look pretty funny <laughs> when, uh, when Sony does it. Now, with all that said, it is time to get to Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. And if you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. Follow the link down below. Supporting this channel a number of ways can gain you an entry. And now announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the news stories that I want to talk about with you all from this past week. Our Tuesday video was PS3, why is it becoming everybody's favorite console? In recent years, I've noticed there's a lot of reverence and appreciation for PS3, which it wasn't really like that 10 years ago, which even that doesn't seem that long ago. However, PS3 in many respects is now becoming a retro console, which I know sounds a little strange and foreign, but I love covering PS3, so go check out um, that sort of deep dive topic idea. And then coming up, as always, another video on Tuesday. Not sure what it will be, but something will be there, I am sure. And that is it. That concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Benecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me. And I will see you all next Friday.